Okay, now we have a dilemma. We've talked about fiscal policy. We've talked about monetary policy. We've talked about how the government can use these tools. But we haven't really talked about whether or not they should use the tools. And so that's what we need to discuss. Is government intervention a good thing in the economy? What I want to do is I want to give you both sides of the argument. Uh, and I'll try to keep my own personal feelings out of this. And so when I'm giving you the arguments, I'm hoping to convince you based on the argument itself. Um, we're going to look at the debate between the Keynesians and the monetarists as to whether or not the government should intervene in the economy. Basically, what the Keynesians argue is the government should intervene in the economy when the economy is not correcting itself. If the economy is correcting itself, we don't have to do anything. But if there are times like when we're in a trough of a business cycle, um, or when we see the economy heading for inflation or heading for a recession, can the government intervene to stop these things from happening? Um, <clears throat> so that's the Keynesians. And I'm going to label all of the Keynesian arguments in blue as we go forward. The monetarists, on the other hand, a group of economists who tend to focus on the money supply. If you recall, when we talked about Milton Friedman, he was a monetarist, right? But the monetarists very strongly believe that the government should not intervene in the economy, that government intervention only messes things up. And so you can think of the monetarists as what we call neoclassical or new classical school of economics. And they, you know, take their cues from Adam Smith and all of the laissez-faire economists. So I'm going to label all of the monetarist arguments in red as we go through. So let's look at five different arguments that tend to be used regarding government intervention in the economy. The first argument that we want to look at is Say's Law, written by a French economist by the name of Jean-Baptiste Say. Say's argument tells us that in its simplest form, <laughs> what the uh, Say's Law tells us, is that supply will create its own demand. Basically, if you leave the economy alone, it will correct itself. Now, in order for Say's Law to work, three things have to be true. There are three mechanisms that help the economy correct. And those are flexible wages, flexible prices, and flexible interest rates. What Say was saying is, let's say a market is out of equilibrium. We have high unemployment. <clears throat> and so if the market is allowed to adjust on its own, if we've got lots of people looking for jobs, not a lot of jobs, what's going to happen? Well, wage rates are going to get bid down. People are going to go to employers and say, hey, I really need a job. I know you're paying $15 an hour, um, but I'm willing to take 10. I'm desperate. I need a job. And so people end up bidding the price down. Same thing with too much of any good. Um, if there's a shortage of a good, the price gets bit, bit up. And so for say, this flexibility of these three mechanisms helps the economy correct. <clears throat> now the monetarists look at say's law and say, yes, <clears throat> it works. If the market's able to correct itself, let it. We don't need government intervention. The market is a great tool. It will do this itself. Well, the Keynesians respond to that and say, eh, those three mechanisms don't always work. Why won't they work? Well, 
Keynesian say, look at wages. We have minimum wages. If the minimum wage is $15 an hour, an employer cannot legally pay anyone less than that. Even if they may want to, even if the employee comes up to them and begs them to be hired at $2 an hour, the employer cannot pay them that. Also, there are contracts, union contracts, whatever. People have contracts which specify the minimum amount somebody can get paid. So some things are sticky and specifically in the downward direction. Prices aren't going to fall to zero because businesses, if they see the price of their good falling, I'll just stop making it. If there's too much of a surplus, they stop making it. All right. Um, interest rates also will technically not fall to zero because banks need to make some money on a loan in order to make it worth their while to make the loan. All right. So who's right? Does Say's Law work or does Say's Law not work? Our next theory is something called the quantity theory of money. Simply, the quantity theory of money says if you take the money supply and you multiply it by velocity, that must equal the price level of the economy times the number of purchases. We normally see it MV equals PQ. Now let's go back and <laughs> define a couple of these things. In particular, velocity. Velocity is how quickly we spend our money. If I were to give you $10, how long would it take you to go out and spend that $10? Okay, that's velocity. Now, believe it or not, you and I have used the quantity theory of money already. When we looked at the circular flow diagram, that is talking about the quantity theory of money. Because if you look, the money supply times velocity is simply the flow of money. How much money is in circulation? How quickly is it being spent? That's the flow of money. The price level of the economy times the number of purchases is GDP, right? And that represents the flow of goods and services. So basically what the quantity theory of money is telling us is that the flow of money must equal the flow of goods and services. All right. On the surface, quantity theory of money is very straightforward. But it's how the monetarists and the Keynesians look at this that gives us our argument for or against government intervention. When looking at the quantity theory of money, the monetarists make a couple of assumptions, which are very important. They assume that velocity is constant, that we spend our money at a constant rate. They also assume that the number of purchases we make is also constant. In particular, they argue that we're always at our potential GDP. We're always producing the maximum we can and purchasing that. All right. So that becomes an issue because if velocity is constant, if it can't change, and quantity is constant, it can't change, then what happens if we use monetary policy? If we increase the money supply, then in order for this equality to hold, prices are going to have to go up. Eek. Remember what we called an increase in the price level of the economy? Inflation. Conversely, if we decrease the money supply in order for this to hold, price levels would have to drop, and we see price levels dropping during a recession. So from the monetarist perspective, the use of monetary policy only creates problems in the economy. Well, from a monetarist perspective, if you believe the money supply is the most important component of the economy, 
certainly makes sense that manipulating something so important would cause major problems. Well, let's look at the Keynesian view. The Keynesians argue that V and Q are not constant. For those of you who work in retail, <clears throat> do people come in at a constant rate to buy goods? No. Also, are we always at full employment? Absolutely not. So the Keynesians argue you can't assume V and Q are constant. And if they can change, then that breaks that direct relationship between M and P that the monetarists argue. So from the Keynesian perspective, yes, you can increase the money supply without causing inflation, or you can decrease the money supply without causing a recession. Now, monetarists don't like to use monetary policy frequently. They say it takes too long. It's too cumbersome. You've got to get the Fed to do something, then the Fed has to get the banks to do something, and then the banks got to change interest rates to get consumers to do something. Too time consuming. And so the Keynesians tend to look at fiscal policy, like fiscal policy better, but they do realize that monetary policy is something that can be used. All right, so it's still a tool in their toolbox.